Open your Bibles this morning. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> Verses 3 and 4. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Last week, in verse 2, we looked at our position in Christ. We began it. We talked about how that you are dead to the reign of sin. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin? And we saw that we're dead to the reign of sin. That was a general statement that Paul made. Now he's going to explain it in detail, what that means, and how you left the reign of sin, and, and ended up where you are now in Christ. You took a journey. For many of us, it's an unexpected journey. For many people in Christianity don't even know they've taken this journey. But here it is. Okay, as a matter of fact, one of the reasons that we spent three weeks discussing the subject of water baptism is so that we would understand that these verses are not speaking of water baptism because water baptism in and of itself does not give you your identification in Jesus Christ. Identification in Jesus Christ is not accomplished by water baptism. So people, I hate to say this, okay, but people who put water in these verses have watered down these verses, if you know what I mean. But as we continue now in Romans chapter 6, it's important for us to keep in mind and always remember the apostle's purpose and what he's trying to accomplish for the body of Christ. We can never lose sight of the main goal and purpose of why Paul is writing these words. And I do believe that if you don't keep this in mind, you can't really arrive here at Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, and, and know what's going on. The emphasis that Paul is placing from chapter 5 all the way down through 6 and 7 and 8 and is the absolute certainty and finality and eternality of the salvation that you have. How that nothing can ever take that away from you. He wants you to be grounded in that so deep that he goes way beyond and he explains these things. At the end of chapter 5, remember he had anticipated a question. Someone is asking him a question and the person who's asking him this question obviously doesn't know who they are in Christ. They don't understand their standing, their status, their new position. That that they have in Christ. So they ask this question, can we continue in sin that grace may abound? It's a flippant question. You know, it's like, oh, can we continue in sin that grace? And of course, Paul said, God forbid. And then he makes the statement that we looked at last week. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And, and, you know, we spent last week exploring the significance of those words, die to sin. And we saw that it had to do with dying to the reign of sin. The reign of sin. It had to do with our being translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son and being conveyed from one to another. Now, uh, as a matter of fact, chapter, that's how chapter 5 ended. That as sin hath reigned unto death, 
even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. That as sin hath reigned, that's the reign of sin. The sin had a reign. It had its own kingdom. It was the king in that kingdom. Even so might grace reign. Now there's another kingdom, the kingdom of grace reigning through righteousness. That's imputed righteousness, not your personal righteousness. You don't have any. It couldn't be your own righteousness. It has to be through the imputed righteousness and because of imputed righteousness unto eternal life. And that can only be achieved one way, by Jesus Christ our Lord. We had nothing to do with it. See, I, I personally think last week's message, this is the most important message I ever preached in my entire life since I've been a Christian, since I've been saved. That's how important that message was. You cannot understand Romans 6 unless you understand verse 2 and its implications of the reign of sin. You can't understand it. You can't understand because your position in Christ was changed from the reign of sin where sin reigned to the reign of grace. You've been moved from one place to the other. So this being understanding that you've been removed from the territory where the enemy ruled and reigned into the territory of a friend who's looking out for your best interest, one who hasn't scattered minds and traps to, to get you to fall, to cause you to fail, to trick you the wiles of the devil to trip you up. So with the, with the background of verse 2 and our justification by faith and then what verse 2 teaches us that of we've been removed from the reign of sin, now Paul is going to give us the details of how it happened. <laughs> this is good. This is exciting because, man, you can actually watch your journey take place in Christ, which is amazing, which is amazing. So now there is a verse in, Ro in Romans 6. It cannot make sense to you. It cannot make any sense to you unless you understand the truth of verse 2. And I'm referring to... To verse 10 for in that he died he died unto sin once but in that he liveth he liveth unto God notice what this verse says this verse says he Jesus Christ died unto sin once well let me ask you this question how can the only person who never sinned die to sin? No. Just, it's a rhetorical question. Let me answer it. How can the only person, the holy, harmless, undefiled, sinless, perfect son of God who never sinned in his life. How can the Bible say that he died to sin? How can God die to sin when he never sinned? <laughs> you cannot understand that verse unless you understand the truth of verse 2. Because it can only be understood by what Paul begins by saying in Romans chapter 6 and verse 2. Jesus Christ died 
to the reign of sin. What does that mean? How does that work, that Jesus Christ died to the reign of sin? Well, remember that when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. Where was he born into? Think of this. Luke 3, 1, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria, and of the region of Traconitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Ananias and Caiaphas being the high priests. Look at the names in these two verses of Scripture. Tiberius Caesar, the stepson of Augustus Caesar, who died 15 years before this verse was written. Augustus Caesar died in A.D. 14. Tiberius had replaced him on the throne of Rome. Tiberius Caesar hated Jews. And then, you all know Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea. He washed his hands of that man's blood and said, do with him what you want. Every name in these verses of Scripture are there because they make up the most despicable group of evil men who could ever have held positions of authority in the then known world. In verse 2, Annas and Caiaphas, the most two corrupt priests Israel had ever known, had ever had, they solely were responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. They connived and contrived and lied and made up stories to make sure that Jesus Christ was killed. This was a dark time in human history when the most evil of men were in authority. And it was in those days That according to verse 2, the word of God came unto John. In the darkest of times is when the word of God comes. Is when it's needed the most. Jesus Christ was born in these days. He was born in the reign of sin. He was born under the reign of sin. And it was during this reign that Jesus Christ died for us. Not his own sin. He died to the reign of sin. But his death was unique. His death was different because it included every single member of the body of Christ. His death had significance for all those who would come after him and believe him and trust in him. That's why Paul says, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. This verse is a contrast. In chapter 5, Adam did something. And all human beings were joined to him as a result of what he did. He sinned. And death passed upon all men. That's what we got in Adam. 
But here is something that Jesus Christ did. Something that all who believe in what he did, all members of the body of Christ benefit from his death. How? We are joined to him. This is not something that's going to happen to you. This is something that has already happened. And we are partakers of it. We are in this thing already. Matter of fact, you cannot be a Christian without this having happened to you. Notice how Paul said it in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. What's that? Died with him. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I. But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. <laughs> and you know what Paul is doing here? In chapter 1 of Galatians, he talked about his when he was saved and delivered from his mother's womb. and He knows what kind of person he was. He knows if anybody deserved God's wrath, it was him. He knew that. And when he says, who love me, <laughs> that's what he means. Who loved even me and gave himself for me, the chief of sinners. And you can put yourself there in this verse. You can put your name there, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am, he said, I am crucified with, with him. It has happened, and it has happened to me because I have trusted Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. And that happens to you the moment you are justified by faith. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. This verse is not talking about sanctification. This verse is talking about identification. Your new identity, now that in verse 2, you died to the reign of sin. You died to that realm where sin had dominion over you. And now you're in Christ in a new realm, in the reign of grace. Your new position and standing and status. You have a new ID card that was given to you. You were in Adam. You were there. But now, you are, you are in Christ. And what Paul teaches us from verse 10, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God, what he's teaching us is that he died, and in verse 3, we died with him. Now, when you think of death, death itself, death, death is, speaks loudly. Death has a powerful message. Death, in essence, says that all your relationships are over. So death says, that's what it speaks. You know, when Jesus Christ lived in this world, he lived where sin reigned. 
I mean, obviously and certainly it had no power over him. But that's not the point in that he died unto sin once. The point is that he died from under the reign of sin. He was done with it. He overcame it. He conquered it. He never faltered during this reign. He never fell during this reign of sin. It had no power over him, although he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He lived in this arena. He lived in this fishbowl, if you will where sin reigned. But his death severed him from the relationship he had with the reign of sin and put him into another realm. And what happened to him, what's true of him, is true of us. What he did. We went with him. Now, Paul goes on, therefore, therefore, because of that truth, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. A while back, I preached three messages on the faith of Christ. Three important messages on the faith of Christ. It's a term, it's unique to the King James Bible. And it's absolutely correct in every sense of the word. It's the faith of Christ. It's the faithfulness of Christ. It's the obedience of Christ to his Father in performing everything that his Father had wanted him to do to perfection. I do always those things that please him, is what he said. And all of that, the faith of Christ, the faithfulness of Christ, is what qualified him to die as our substitute and pay the penalty for our sins and I said during those messages and I said it after also so that it can put a picture in your mind to give you a visual representation of what really happened when you trusted Jesus Christ and how the faith of Christ applies to you when you trust Christ, and I said that basically what Jesus Christ does when you believe, when you're, you're justified by faith, he takes you by the collar, and he takes you the rest of the way home. He completes the journey for you because you're in him. And he takes you and will take you all the way to the end of the journey. It's the faith of Christ that accomplishes that for us. Thank the Lord for that. Because if it was all up to us, like there are people sitting in churches right now, and they're being bashed and bombarded with, you have to do this, and you have to do that, and if you don't do this, you're, you're going to lose yourself. They're hearing all these things. The guilt and the manipulation of that. No wonder as Christians are so discouraged today. But it's the faith of Christ that accomplishes that for us. We don't do anything in our salvation except believe and let the word of God work in us and through us and, you know, that. Well, in these verses in Romans chapter 6, Paul is describing the journey that we take after we're justified by faith. If you can picture in your mind 
Or if you can remember seeing in a movie, even in a cartoon, you see when the genie comes out of the bottle and he's big at the top, he comes down to a point, and, and what's your wish? Right? You, you, you see that, right? Or sometimes you'll see other movies where somebody's going to be transported, they're time traveling or something, and also you see them and, and they, and they take off like that, and then they're uh, giants, whatever, wherever they're taken to, you know, but you know that, that moment of transference. That's what happened to you. That's what happened to you when you, you were morphed into what we're going to look at right now. You were translated, conveyed from one kingdom into another. And you're in that already, right now. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, you were into him. That's why putting water here is like so inappropriate. You were morphed into his death. And what death did is it ended the old relationship that you had. You had that, that you had with the reign of sin. And now Paul continues. Now that you're baptized into him, okay? You've been, you're there. You're in him now, right? Therefore, in light of that, in light of that truth, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Therefore, in light of the fact that you were baptized into his death, and death ends the old relationship, so why does Paul come here now and continue with the thought of burial? Burial. Because nothing, nothing, um, nothing em emphasizes the finality of death like burial. When you see somebody or you look at a body and you say, he looks dead to me. He looks like he's dead. But you're not going to bury him if there's any doubt, right? <laughs> you're not going to bury someone if you... I'm not sure if he's dead, but well, let's bury him. <laughs> no, you're not going to do that. Right? When they buried Jesus Christ, it was the proof that his relationship to that life was ended. It was the certificate that everything was over. Burying him was the absolute proof of the fact that he was dead, and it testified to everyone that was looking that he is completely finished with life as he knew it and his relationship to it. You lower the body into the ground and you cover it with dirt as the final act that says it's all over. That's what burial is. What does that mean for us? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism. This is the baptism of 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized. I'm doing that thing, you know, so you realize the picture of, you know. I wish I could do it. And then the, wow. That's what happened. You know, we don't realize it. Nothing changes in you physically. You're still thinking the same. You still have the same desires. 
you know, but you're not here anymore. You are officially, you have, you've been, here you are. That's what Romans 6, 2 teaches you. This explains it. This explains how it happened. Okay? So therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. We not only died with him, we've also been buried with him to show that we also are dead to the reign of sin. Our relationship with life as we know it, have known it is also ended. That's what the burial marks here. It marks the end of the reign of sin where we lived, it marks the end of that and puts us into a new place where we can function differently if we know what to do, if we can function that way. Now, we can be thankful. Paul doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. Notice in verse 4, he continues, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so... We also should walk in newness of life. Your identification with Christ is not only by virtue of being dead and being buried with him. It's that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Now, what does the resurrection teach us? Death taught us something. Burial taught us something. Resurrection teaches us something also. The first thing that it teaches us in this verse is the omnipotent power of God. Notice that he was raised from the dead by by the glory of the Father. When God manifests his glory, his own internal, intrinsic worth and value and who he is, when he does that, when he demonstrates his glory, he's manifesting his power and showing you who he is. And that's what the resurrection of Jesus Christ did. It manifested the glory of God. This is how Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 1. Oh, in Ephesians chapter 1. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Paul wants the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened that you may know. May know what? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe? Forget this universal reconciliation business. I know people, there's a popular doctrine that's starting to really make some waves now. Universal reconciliation. Doesn't matter who you are, you're all saved now. Even the devil's going to be saved at the end. No. Toward to us word who believe. According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. This is one of the great statements in Scripture that demonstrates the eternal power and glory of Almighty God that he demonstrated when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Because of that great power that God had in raising Christ from the dead, on the day of Pentecost, Peter said this, Him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, 
ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. It was not possible that death could keep its grip on Jesus Christ and keep him in the grave. It has held every other man who has died. It held your grandfather and your grandmother and everybody else that died. That's what Paul said, that as sin hath reigned. That's what the, the reign of sin did. The wages of sin is death. And when sin reigned, it reigned unto death. Death is a powerful enemy. It's a powerful enemy. But when it came to the Son of God, it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Sin and death had done their utmost to hold them. Listen, they thought they had won the battle. The stone was rolled over the mouth of the grave. It had been sealed. Surely that's the end of him. This is the end of the line. But then all of a sudden, this glorious power, this incredible power of God, not even sin and death can hold them. It was not possible. Man, think of that. It was not even possible that he should be holding of it. <laughs> In other words, the resurrection of Christ is the ultimate proof that he conquered the reign of sin and that he has nothing more to do with it ever. Hey, the only thing sin could produce was death. That's what happened. Death entered. Sin entered. And death by sin. But that was the, the, the length of its dominion or the extent of its dominion and power and the rule of reign, and the rule and the reign of sin. That was all it could do. That was as far as it could go, bring you to death. That was it. That was the end of the line for that reign. That, that's what makes this reign so great. Because Jesus Christ comes along, he dies, and he's buried so far, and he was made sin for us. He who knew no sin. So, so far, the reign of sin and death has accomplished its goal in Jesus Christ. But that's because it, there's something it doesn't know. I mean, the wages of sin is death. So the reign of sin accomplished what it set out to do when Jesus Christ died and he was buried. But the reign of sin was totally unprepared for what was coming. <laughs> oh, man. No, it was unprepared for what was coming. A power so great, a power so glorious that it breaks the shackles of death and it's not possible that he should be holding of it. Man, that's your Savior. <laughs> that's who you trusted in to save you. So death had to release its grip on him. And he came out. And you know, that, that's why he came. Remember these words in Hebrews chapter 2? But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels,
for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. I mean, here he is, the one who inhabits eternity, the one whose goings forth have been from everlasting, from of old. The one who in John 17 said, Father, glorify thou me with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. That one, the one who created angels, the one who created the universe, that one, this verse says, was made a little lower than the angels. Why? For the suffering of death. That's why he came. But notice, it doesn't stop there. Notice today, now, now, crowned with glory and honor. What happened? What happened between him being made lower than the angels for the suffering of death? And now crown, what happened in between those two things? Yeah, the resurrection. The resurrection happened. He was made lower than the angels so he could come and accomplish something that not one of Adam's fall, fallen children could do. He came to taste. For every man, he died for every man. That's what he did. I mentioned this verse a while ago, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem. Stopping it, I'm stopping it there because here again is the eternal Son of God, the creator of all things. And notice that he was made of a woman, made a little lower than the angels. And he came into this world through the womb of a virgin. And why did he do that? To redeem. Do you remember this verse in Romans 3? Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. His redem our redemption was accomplished in the death, burial, and resurrection. That's how he redeemed us. And notice how that affects us. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. When Jesus Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, he entered into a new realm. He entered into another place. He left the realm or the, where the reign of sin dominated the children of men. He left that, but when he left, he basically like created a new reign. I, mean, I know it exists, it, a new reign, the reign of grace, and brought you there with him. So there's a new place called the reign of grace. I do believe that that's what Paul is speaking of in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. <sighs> right? All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He's a new creature because he's been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. 
That's, he's a new creature in that way. Old things are passed away. The reign of sin. You're no longer under the reign of sin. All things are become new. The reign of grace. And as a result of that, we should walk in newness of life. The reason that we can walk in newness of life is because we have been moved. That's what Romans 6.14 says, for ye are not under the law. You're not under the reign of sin anymore, but under grace, into a new reign, into a new realm, into a new reality. We died with Christ because we were baptized into his death. We're buried with Christ as an evidence that our relationship with the past doesn't exist anymore. We're raised with Christ because we're in a new place called the reign of grace. You know, we frequently don't realize that we are, we're not under the reign of sin. But we're not. We're not under it. And I made a point last week of saying, you know, because people always ask this question, if I'm not under the reign of sin, why do I still sin? That's a good question. And the point that I made last week is that you will not find anywhere in what Paul is saying to you that you have become sinless. Only God, who is Jesus Christ, was sinless, and there is none like unto him, and there never will be. Now, when you get your glorified body, when it's all over, and what has happened for real as a fact takes on its substance. See, right now, we live in this body that he calls, in verse 6, this body of sin, Romans 6, 6. We drag this thing around. But there's something on the inside of you called the new man. He hates him. He hates him. Okay? This is the great struggle in the Christian life. You know, the great question that people have in all the churches who don't understand the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ is they try to make their people stop sinning. And that has never been my goal, to make you stop sinning. Although you should. Although I should. We all should. But isn't that why Paul, at the end of verse 4, says we also should walk? We should walk in newness of life? We should do that? Do we do that to perfection? I don't see any halos, so I'm going to assume, no, we don't do that to perfection. But we can walk in newness of life. But, you know, we'll talk about the body of sin next time. And hopefully try to get some understanding of that. You know, there's two natures in you. You have two natures. You have this new person living inside of you who's holy, harmless, and sinless. He doesn't sin. This sins. This sins. But the sin that you commit here can never affect him on the inside because he's not part of this. He's not part of this. That's why this is gone. That's why one of these days this is done with. And then that other one gets a new body that is in perfect keeping with the truth of what the inside man is. You see, 
That's what regeneration is. You have a person living on the inside of you that hates this guy. Because this guy always makes him do things. The, uh, the guy on the inside is going, I don't know. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. Hello? Hello? Welcome to the real world. You know, that's the real world. We live in it. Amen? Amen. Oh, thank you. I, I didn't know if there was anybody left here. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know the, when you live in a world where 98% of Christianity is teaching you that you can stop sinning and that you should stop sinning because you lose your fellowship with God, and for some people it's you lose your salvation, and then you have this small minority of people who go, nah, I understand, I understand. I am not perfect. Okay, but I am perfect in Christ. I'm complete in Christ. Okay, and so I'm not going to beat myself up because there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. There is none. You know, and God remembereth our frame that we are but dust. You know, God remembers that. That's why, that's why we have the blood of Christ that flows. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stain. That happened one time at the cross and cleansed every sin you've ever committed and will ever commit. But there are still times that we sin. But that sin is gone instantaneously because that fountain of blood is always flowing. It's always, it's like Niagara Falls just flowing over you all the time to make sure that you don't have sin because if you died with sin in you, you could not go to heaven. Sin cannot enter heaven. So it either has to be a continual flow of forgiveness or you're doing it on your own. And that's the difference between you're doing it on your own and the faith of Christ, which takes me and says, okay, I know you're not perfect, but come on. Come on. You're going to make it to the end of this thing. Why? Because you're riding with me. You're in my vehicle now. How did you get there? You were morphed into Jesus Christ. That's the story. That's the truth of Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Hey, Paul's going to go further. And he's going to talk about being planted. Oh, man. Planted? So we're going to stop here this week, and we will continue next week. Amen? Amen? Lord, I'm thankful this morning that we can open the Word of God, look at these great truths, and explain them, hopefully, in ways that the body of Christ can grasp it, understand it, enter into it, glory in it. So I pray that the words of this message today would be forged upon the tablets of our hearts and that we would walk away knowing that we have been transferred from where we were to being in Christ. For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, even me, and gave himself for me. Pray these things in that name that is above every name. 
the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ.